All right, it is time for our Axe interview of the week, and who better to spend some time with than our dear friend, uh, Dr. Myron Roll. I mean, <laughs> the dude's resume is just unparalleled. Um, a neurosurgeon, a former uh, NFL player, a Rhodes Scholar. I mean, and, and listen, I go back with Myron Roll. Uh, he's been my role model uh, since <laughs> since he was a Rhodes Scholar. I believe that's when you and I first met. And I said back then, I want to grow up and be like you and what you've done in the years since, including the publication of your book, The 2% Way, How a Philosophy of Small Improvements. Wait, let me get this right. How a Philosophy there of Small is. Improvements took me to Oxford, the NFL, and neurosurgery. Um, this, this should be on everybody's reading list if you want to know how to tackle life uh, the way that Myron Roll has uh, in various arenas, whether it's football, whether it's philanthropy, and of course, uh, medicine. Um, but here's where I want to start with you, Myron, and thank you so much for being here, man, is um, I saw you talk about recently in an interview about the vulnerability you display in this book when it comes to the self-doubt, uh, the uncertainty, and the social awkwardness uh, that you've experienced over the years. And I said to myself, wow, like this is a guy who on the outside, like looks like he's got it all together and could walk into any room and feel comfortable. How did you push through those battles uh, with self-doubt uh, and, and uncertainty and insecurity? Well, you know, that's uh, one of the blessings of this book, Mike. Uh, you know, it's just you have this opportunity to be very vulnerable and open and transparent with uh, readers about the challenges and the struggles uh, that you faced. I remember coming down as a prep school kid in New Jersey down to Florida State, Tallahassee, Florida, where a lot of my teammates had dreadlocks, gold teeth, listening to plies and trick daddy and eating country fried steak. I mean, just the culture was so different than what I was used to. <laughs> and then hopping over to England at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar and being feeling like a little bit like a jock when you have people who have got nine degrees and have been published 17 times and, you know, are written about in Nature or Science Magazine or something like that. So always feeling like a little bit boxed out or a little bit uncomfortable in the way that I felt I was able to mitigate that that feeling of awkwardness or that feeling of discomfort or dis-ease was applying this 2% way, this process of just saying, you know what, let me just get a little bit better at something that I know I can improve on every single day, those consistent steps towards being a better version of myself and then finding that common ground with those around me so that I'm able to have peace and continue to move forward. When were you able to enjoy your first small win? Because I'm, I'm, I'm sure we all have small wins we don't necessarily look at it in the moment. Then you look back and you say, wait a minute. That was that was significant. I kind of glossed that over. I didn't celebrate that enough. When did you get to that point where you were aware of the small wins that you had and you were able to celebrate them? You know, so I learned the 2% way process from my coach at Florida State University, my defensive back coach, D coordinator, Mickey Andrews. He wanted us to get a little bit better every day in practice, our stamina, our ability to tackle, our ability to high point the football. And I extrapolated that mindset of just feeling like I can take small steps and breaking down a bigger goal and feel good about myself in doing it. And so when I applied for the Rhodes Scholarship, the first time I went through my interview process, I did terribly. I, I just, I was unprepared. I was egotistical and arrogant. I went in just not ready to perform at my optimum. And I took that 2% way process of activating and mobilizing resources around me. I found a Rhodes Scholar who could help do a mock interview with me to get me ready. I read articles. I was watching CNN and all the late night news so I can stay up on current events. I would talk to people around Waffle House and around Tallahassee community about the Rhodes Scholarship and try to get my words out and, and, and enunciate as best I possibly could. And I saw those small steps every day end up in me uh, winning that scholarship and changing my life and making me a role model for young people around the country and even around the world. So it was definitely a blessing. And I think that was the first time that I've seen that process take hold and get me from point A to point B seamlessly. You seem to have the world and again, man, I've been impressed with you for the first time I heard about you and even more so when I, when I got a chance to finally meet you. Uh, I don't know how many years ago that is. That was now almost 20 years ago feels like. Um, you seem to have the world in, in the palm of your hand and seem to just have, uh, you know, such direction and, and, and such, you know, um, 
self-awareness about it. And then you're doing everything that you seem to put your mind to, I guess I would say. So even right now, even as you write the book and you pass along this 2% way wisdom to others, what are you getting better at 2% each day right now in your own, either professional or personal life as the case may be? Well, it's a great question. Yeah, I think for me, I'm always trying to get better as a father. We had talked, uh, you know, off air about, um, you know, being a new dad uh, again, a second time. I have twins of 21 months, and new twins are 30, uh, three weeks old. Uh, so y'all like I'm trying two, to balance y'all like that. twos in your family. You're all about everything good for you comes in twos, twins that's twice right. in two percent way. I got, I feel that's you. Right. I like it. That's on brand. Congratulations. That's right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, definitely congrats to my wife, mostly. I mean, she's a, a rock star. <laughs> uh, she's there amazing. I just do what she says, you know. <laughs> but, um, man. but, but yeah, so, you know, being a father um, and, and, you know, trying to improve, you know, how I'm leading this home uh, in this Christian environment that we're in, uh, trying to improve um, my foundation, my philanthropic efforts back home in the Bahamas and around the Caribbean, delivering equitable and timely accessible neurosurgical care for the most vulnerable populations, those marginalized populations in lower middle income countries in that region. So there's a lot you know, that we're doing, but thankfully by the grace of God, I've been able to stay on balance, stay on beat and continue to move forward every day by having people who can check in on me, make sure I'm doing well, praying, you know, writing things down, checking it off, and then having that moment of self-reflection, like, did I get better today? Have I moved forward? And then tracking my progress every month or, or six months to say, yes, I have gotten better and I am a better version of myself, better today than I was yesterday, for sure. Man, that's such a word. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, Latoya, who herself is a pediatric dentist? Okay, so it's like, you know, and, and you, I, I'm sure you appreciate the uh, the phrase that we love to use when it comes to our, our wives. You definitely outkick your coverage as a former player yourself. You know, you know what we're talking about. I mean, just what, what kind of, 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 of woman is she? Because I imagine she makes you better uh, as, as, as a father, as a husband, as a neurosurgeon, as a partner. Like, just tell us more about the relationship that you guys have. Well, Toy is all that. She's a queen. Uh, she's my rock. She's phenomenal. It was the hardest time of my life when uh, the pandemic hit. And, um, you know, I sent, she was pregnant with our first set of twins. And I sent her down to be in Georgia with her, her family because I was afraid that I would infect her and that somehow would infect the kids that were unborn at the time. So that three, four, five months that we were separated was very difficult uh, to try to mitigate some of the pressure that I had in the hospital. She's somebody who I can decompress with. I can just be unfiltered with and talk through a lot of challenges. And when she wasn't there, uh, based on the pandemic, it was tough. But she's a rock. She's amazing. Uh, she went to Tennessee State University, HBCU, and now she's a pediatric dentist in Orlando and just a phenomenal person that is everything that you said. My best friend holding this family together so strong. Uh, and I love her dearly. And, and she she makes us all go. And, uh, you know, I, I typically, you know, lead the family, you know, pounding my chest, but she tells me what to do in my ear and then I do what she says. So that's kind of how <laughs> it you works. Go. You take you, you take coaching two sets of twins. Mike, you want to talk about some zone coverage right there. I couldn't imagine that, man. That's amazing. <laughs> that's crazy. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, now, Mike, I used to, uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, in Boston, NBC Sports Boston, my weekly, my, my weekly guest, my weekly analyst was Dr. Myron Roll. And we would just talk about all things NFL. So I just got used to calling him Dr. Roll. I'm not, I, I can't even call you Myron. I got to call you Dr. Roll. <laughs> so Dr. Roll, uh, good to see you in this space. I've heard you, and we never talked about this. When we were doing football coverage on Sundays. I've heard you made, uh, make a couple of references to your faith. Uh, tell us about that journey and how may, maybe it's what some of the some of the milestones are, uh, some of the revelations are for you because it it sounds like uh, th that informs pretty much everything that you're doing. Absolutely, you know, when I was 10 years old, I had a bit of a temper. Uh, I was an angry young man, and I think it was coming from the Bahamas and growing up in a suburban white town in southern New Jersey. Uh, I would get called racial epithets at times. I would get suspended from school. I would fight. I would uh, steal from our local grocery store. These things that people are like, wow, really, Dr. Oh, this was you when you grew up? But it really was. I just was, I did well in school and I was a good athlete, but I thought that my behavior didn't have to match anything else. I just thought I can have an attitude and do what I wanted to do. And uh, one time I just took it a little bit too far and 
beat up this kid very badly. He had to go to the hospital for his injuries. He took me to court in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And um, thankfully, by the grace of God, I was able to walk out of that courtroom just shaking his hand, doing some community service. Uh, my parents were very, very nervous that we were going to get like deported to the Bahamas or something. But, you know, at that point, I made the pivot. I made the switch. I gave my life to Christ about a month later. And I started thinking about and thinking through things with the lens of Christianity that, you know, I, I have to be better. I have to do more. Uh, I know that, you know, I have a God who's helping me, who looks over me, covers me, helps lead me and guide me, protects me through all things. And so that's been sort of a fuel to continue to move forward and suppress that anger and that temper that I had to be a good person, to be a good human and treat people well. And so I've never gone back to 10-year-old Meyer, and I've, I've been able to grow from that. And I, I thank my faith a lot, a lot for that. It's good stuff right there. Uh, going going back it to is. the uh, it is. the two the two percent way, uh, just kind of like reverse engineering this a little bit. It reminds me of what's what's the uh, the proverb? Or, or, you know, how does uh, how does a man eat uh, um, an, an elephant with one bite at a time? It kind of reminds me of that of that sort of thing, that sort of mentality to you know achieving big goals. But in the in the reverse, do you feel that people? Because this really did speak to me. Uh, as, as simple as it is, as it, as it seems on the surface, this, this really did speak to me. Do you find that people tr like focus too much on the 100% and maybe that causes quite a bit of strife, quite a bit of anxiety, quite a bit of doubt, quite a bit of, uh, you know, anxiousness when it comes to our journeys because instead of just focus on that the little bit at a time, we're trying to get to 80 and 90 and 100% as quickly as possible. Does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense, and I think that is an, uh, an absolute, uh, you know, uh, challenge that we face today. We can compare our journey and try to juxtapose what we're doing to somebody else, especially through social media. You can look to see mm -hmm. what someone's doing. You think they have it yesterday. You think they have it tomorrow. You think they have it all done next week, and, and you might feel like you're not enough, that you're not good enough, that you're not doing enough, that you're not worthy. And so I think the 2% way helps break that down, move away from that noise, that background noise that could distract you or even depress you in a way and keeps you away from comparing mm -hmm. yourself to someone else. You don't know what they're doing in their life. You don't know the struggles and demons that they have to face, but what you have to do is continue to move forward, have that small win, stack up those victories and win each day. And, and it's actually a, a neuroscientific process to this too, guys. I mean, we have six lobes in our brain. One of our lobes is called the limbic lobe. And if you are able to achieve well and feel good about yourself, your reward pathway in your limbic lobe is activated where these neurotransmitters are released and you have this feeling of euphoria, like I just did something very good. And I don't think we celebrate ourselves enough. We don't celebrate the journey through the process enough. We often feel like we have to just put our head down and, and just look up when a big goal happens or a big achievement happens, but that's not true. There's enough danger and depression in the world today that we can love ourselves every single day, be grateful for having the breath of life and be grateful for being able to move forward every single day. And uh, this book is, is all about that and we're excited about it. The doors of the church are open. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, at, at, at my church, church they that was sing, church and school anyway. at the same time. That was, that yeah. was church that's and right, medical school right. at the same time. I was going to say, <laughs> now, it's been, it, it, the pandemic, I haven't been to church in a while, but the church I went to uh, before the pandemic, they used to sing the song at the end. I, 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 we need a choir here. I can't be the, uh, I can't be the choir for it, but that deserves <laughs> the song. some song. The organist. But let me, uh, <laughs> let me ask you this, uh, Dr. O, most of the time, You'll hear professional athletes generally at the end of their career and say, you know, I'm going to miss uh, the camaraderie. There's nothing outside of football or nothing outside of whatever the sport is that can really compare to this. And most of the time I understand what they're saying. But in your case, I mean, you have a team working with you. You're saving lives. That euphoria that you just mentioned, I'm sure is there when you help somebody who came in uh, in, in, a, in a lesser condition, you made them better. How does it compare? I mean, I, I would imagine it might be greater. Dare I say, is it even greater than a sports achievement? Uh, no question. No question about it, Michael. I mean, I think that, um, you know, having the opportunity to, to operate in someone's brain or someone's spinal cord, uh, it just feels like you are blessed that you have uh, this moment where somebody is vulnerable, have nowhere else to go, and nowhere else to look and here they are on your operating table with your attending or your colleague and you have the chance to save this life or help uh cure an ailment that they might possibly have and working through 
this science, this discipline of neurosurgery, it's given me profound perspective on life in general. You know, we have people who are walking dogs the day before and out at church the day before, and then for some reason have a stroke or get hit or fall or something like that, and their whole life has changed. You know, how they breathe, how they eat, who sees them, if they're gonna be able to walk again or talk again, that's all change. And so life is so precious. And the ability to help bring people back from the brink of death or the brink of just severe pain or severe disability to a sense of a meaningful and a purposeful life, uh, that, that does feel good and uh, it's very rewarding. And uh, it makes, you know, uh, waking up at 4.30 in the morning to get there for, for cases and leaving 7.30 at night, making sure that everybody's tucked away after you leave for the day. Uh, it all makes it worth it, for sure. Dr. Martin Rowe, this was certainly worth it for us. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be our Axe Effect interview of the week, man. You exude such confidence. Uh, I'm confident that your next 35 years, you're going to do some incredible stuff. Thank you for sharing this story. Thank you for sharing this handbook with the rest of us. Right. It's another way that you're helping people. What you got, two years left in your residency at MGA? That's uh, right, MGA. two years. Well, my, yeah. yeah, my God, I, I do want to say something too really quickly that uh, that really yeah, helped please. me. And you might you might not remember this, but when I was uh, on my third day in my draft, uh, you and I were texting and I was very nervous that I wasn't going to get drafted. And I was, and you kept saying, Myron, keep your head up, keep your head up, keep your head up. And then finally, when I got drafted, pick 207 in the sixth round, you text me and said, boom, there it is. I'll never forget it. So it made me feel good. You've been with me for a long time. And Michael Holly, man, obviously we, we've been riding together with NBC Boston. So I appreciate you brothers. And thank you for giving me the space to talk thank about you. this book. It really means a lot. Absolutely. No, it means the world to us, man. Thank you so much. We're proud thank of you, you brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we are. Take care of them babies. Two sets of twins. Man. Woo. <laughs> Two, like, that's the next book. That's the next book. <laughs> right? That's the, that's the 2% way. The, the two times two way right there. <laughs> for sure. Hey, thanks for watching Brother From Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern time on Peacock. Appreciate you.